Now are we ready to launch into the next 10 years of this ministry? We are ready to go. Turning your Bible into your Old Testament to the prophecy of Haggai. Haggai is the correct pronunciation. I don't think I've always pronounced it correctly in the past. Haggai. And if you start at the end of the Old Testament, you just have to go to the left. It's the book just before the last one. No, the last two. Uh, you got Malachi, then you come to Zechariah, then you come to Haggai. So it's just three books away from the end. <coughs> Haggai. I'd like to say at the outset that I appreciate the two sisters this morning that are wearing hats. Uh, you apparently watched the royal funeral. And one of the... Th- uh, pardon me, not the royal funeral. <laughs> The royal wedding. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. The, the queen did not look happy about that yesterday. She didn't crack a smile the whole time. Harry don't know it yet, but it is his funeral. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't know it yet, but it's his funeral. Anyway, um, it's so, you can see how far they're veering away from the traditionalism. They had that fiery black preacher up there preaching and this, had this one prelate sitting behind him. I mean, stone face. He showed absolutely no emotion. Even when the guy looked at him, he wouldn't even look back at him. But anyway, hats never went out of style in England, nor did they go out of style in the black community. And I, I love hats. I just, uh, I wish they would come back, but I don't always get what I wish. I wish dresses on women would come back. I love a woman in a lovely, modest dress. I really do. So anyway, I, maybe I should, I've been praying about that. Maybe I should pray for that, you know. All right, Haggai, chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. Now, Darius was the king of Persia. Came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come. The time is... Uh, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Uh, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, and bring wood, and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Now, our fathers, as, as we launch into the study of this prophet, I pray with thee, to, thee to breathe the holy quietness upon the congregation, and to help me to collect my thoughts, and give me my energy and strength, with which to make bold and plain declaration of the word of God. Forgive our sins, and let not iniquity be our stumbling block, so as to hinder us from our understanding. And let this passage of Scripture be to us what Thou hast said it is, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, and that we might from these pages find comfort through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, the first thing is a general introduction. This is a prophecy of the Old Testament. And it is written for our prophet, and I'm going to give you two passages that will clearly establish that. So we're not wasting our time when we're studying Old Testament history and prophecies that relate to it. Uh, First of all, in Romans 15, 14, Romans 15, 14, 15, 4, I'm sorry, 15, 4, Romans 15, 4, thank you. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, and that would include what I just read to you from the prophecy of Haggai, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. We're New Testament Gentile Christians, and it's written for us to learn something. That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So that, so there's something in this passage that will give us hope and provide comfort for us as we study it. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, those words that establish the inspiration of the text of God's Word... In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So when we sum those two passages up, we find that there's something in this passage for us to learn 
that will be useful for us. There's something here that will give us hope and comfort. There's something here that will reprove and correct us. And there's something in here that will teach us the right thing to think and do because it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. Now, Haggai was among the prophets who prophesied to the nation of Israel after their return from being taken captive 70 years by the nation of Babylon. That is a signal event in Old Testament history. And some of the things I'm going to talk about today, if you're not a Bible reader and you're not familiar with the events of the Bible, you may have a little trouble following what I'm saying. But if you're a Bible reader, you're going to know what I'm talking about. But the nation, through their grievous sin against God, God allowed the Babylonian Empire to come in there and decimate them and take them captive and destroy their temple and burn it to the ground. And then after 70 years in fulfillment of prophecy that God gave through Jeremiah, He allowed a remnant of those people to return to their land, re-inhabit their cities, and rebuild Jerusalem, and most specifically, rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. This 70-year captivity ended with the overthrow of the Babylonian Empire by a succeeding empire called the Medo-Persian. And Darius was a king in that empire. And it was in the days of Darius this prophecy was written. So God ended the captivity with the overthrow of Babylon by the Medo-Persians and a decree of King Cyrus, a Persian king, allowing the Jews to return to their land and rebuild their temple which had been destroyed by the Babylonians. I'm going to read you some Bible history. Come over to Second Chronicles 36. Because what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you the background against which the prophecy is uttered. I don't even know if I'll get to the verses I read this morning. I just want to get you to where you can plug into them. I want to give you the historical background, the historical setting for this prophecy. And there's a lot of good practical lessons that we can glean from this if we pay attention. <coughs> But over here in the book of Second Chronicles, and we'll notice chapter 36 and verse 14 will give us the events leading up to the one, to the restoration of the people. Moreover, all the chief priests and the people transgressed very much in all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he'd hallowed in Jerusalem. They had taken heathen gods and heathen rites and heathen rituals and had observed them inside the house of God. Of course, history repeats itself, doesn't it? You've got that same thing happening in Christendom. They're taking heathen holidays and celebrating them in, in the church. Same type of thing. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. And these messengers have stern rebukes. They did not preach all comfortable messages. They reproved the people because of their sins, told them things they did not want to hear. But the Bible says it was because he had compassion. When a man of God brings you a sermon that smites you across the face because of sin in your life, God is having compassion on you. It may not sound like the preacher is having it, but God is having it. To warn you, to commend your ways before the judgment falls. But they mocked the messengers of God, treated it with contempt, made fun of the preachers, and despised his words, and misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. God gives you a space to repent of your wickedness. When the man of God is up there warning you about it, and if you don't do it, a judgment is going to come and there won't be a remedy. In other words, it's coming whether you like it or not. You, you're given by God a space to repent. I don't know how long that space is. It's not advisable to play around with it. Repent before you pass it. Because once you pass it, the judgment is going to come and it will be without remedy. In other words, this nation was going to go into captivity and nothing was going to stop it. In fact, Jeremiah finally just preached to the people, look, when the Babylonians come, go out and make your peace. Go out and make your peace. Don't even try to fight it. Don't even try to resist it because the judgment was irremediable. And therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. I think it's interesting to notice when people get older they start doing this. And they do. They stoop for age. You can always tell when a man's getting older he starts walking more and more like this. <coughs> I'm not there yet. 
or he that stooped for age, and he gave them unto gave them all into his hand, and they had no compassion. All you got to do is read the book of Lamentations. Jeremiah was an eyewitness to when these Chaldeans came in and destroyed his nation. He was an eyewitness, and it was cruel destruction, cruel. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. A complete economic collapse of the nation. And they burnt the house of God. And break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And then that had escaped from the sword, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons, until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. And that's where we find the prophecy of Haggai stepping in. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath. Nobody sowed the fields in Israel during this time. And to fulfill three score and ten years, that's 70 years. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord is God be with him. And notice how this book ends. And let him go up. Go up where? Let him go up. Well, now flip over to the next book, Ezra, and he'll complete the sentence for us. But it's interesting that the book of Chronicles ends on the word up. And I'll tell you why that is as we move forward in the study. Just remember that. When he issues the decree, he tells the people, you can go back to your land and and rebuild that house. And whosoever is willing, let him go up. All right. Then in Ezra chapter 1, it repeats what we just read. It, It picks up and repeats the last two verses of 2 Chronicles. So it's continuing the story. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up. And that's right there where Second Chronicles ended. Now, there's your little piece of Bible trivia. So, if you're ever on Jeopardy, and they have a section called Bible, Old Testament History, select it. And if one of the questions is, what's the last word in Second Chronicles? You know. It's up. Providing they're referring to the King James Version, let's hope they are. And you might win your millions playing Jeopardy. That show makes me feel so stupid. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know a lot of trivia. Let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus issues the decree for them to go up. Now, the prophets who prophesied before And up to the time that the nation was taken captive are referred to as the former prophets. Now, let me prove that to you. And and what I'm going to show you is Haggai was not among the former prophets. We could call him the latter prophets because he prophesied of the latter times. But let's get the former prophets first. The ones that prophesied before the captivity and all the way up to the captivity, they are thus designated as the former prophets. This can be seen if you back to Haggai, Haggai, pardon me, you want to go to the book of Zechariah, the next book in line after Haggai, and notice what Zechariah writes. And Zechariah and Haggai were contemporaneous. They prophesied together, and we'll see a verse that tells us that later on. Zechariah 1, 4 and 6, through 6. Zechariah says to the people, Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? 
and the prophets. Do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. Notice there in verse 4 what he called these prophets, the former prophets. These were the ones that were trying to call the nation back to God to avert the destruction of their city and temple, and they didn't listen to them. And therefore, they had to acknowledge that everything the prophet said was going to happen, happened. Their nation was destroyed, their city, their temple and city were destroyed, the temple burnt, and they taken captive, just like the former prophets said. The former prophets would have been guys like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Amos, Nahum, Zephaniah, Joel, those guys. Those were the former prophets that prophesied before the captivity. And then if you look in Zechariah chapter 7, he'll mention those guys again. And he calls them the former prophets. So you've got the prophets before the captivity, the former prophets. Then you've got the prophets that come after the captivity. And these would be guys like Daniel. Daniel prophesied after the captivity. Haggai, whom we're looking at. Zechariah and Malachi. And these prophets called the people to restore their city and temple and also prophesied to them of the latter days of their history. And we'll see that if we keep this study up in Haggai, how he looks forward to the later days of their history. But in Zechariah 7 and verse 7 we read, Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets? When Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain. And then verse 12, yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. People do that. God's children sometimes do that. The preacher's up there telling them the plain truth, showing them their sins, and they just, "Mm, they're not going to do that. Just harden themselves against it. I don't let that guy tell me what to do. They made their heart as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by His Spirit in the form of prophets. When you're reading the prophets, you're reading the very words of the Spirit of God sent in them. It's given by the inspiration of God through the Holy Spirit. The prophets spoke as the Holy Ghost moved them. That's what he's telling us here. As which the Lord of hosts has sent in His Spirit by the former prophets, therefore a great wrath came from the Lord of hosts because they didn't listen to the former prophets. And now they have their latter prophets. And these latter prophets are saying, you better listen to us. Your fathers, remember, didn't listen to the former prophets and look at what happened to them. If you know what's good for you, you better listen to us. And don't make the same mistake that your fathers made when they refused to hear the message sent by the Spirit in the former prophets. Now, we've already read the last two verses of Second Chronicles 36 and the first two verses of Ezra 1, 1 and 2. And in those verses, we find Cyrus, king of Persia, issuing a decree to allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem. And this is important, and you don't want to forget this little tidbit of information. It's extremely important. And that is that Cyrus had divine authority from God to order the Jews to go back and rebuild. He even said, he said, the God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he, the God of heaven, hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Now, or Judah. Now, the interesting thing is that this particular charge that was given to Cyrus to build that house, are you ready for this, was given at least, if not more, than 120 years before Cyrus was ever born. It was issued through the prophet Isaiah. And you can read that charge in Isaiah some 120 plus years before the birth of Cyrus. And thus the events that we are studying today show the fulfillment of the Word of God, the prophetic accuracy of the Word of the living God. And these things that we're studying about Cyrus issuing the decree for the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple after the Babylonians destroyed it, this is not just biblical history. Secular history confirms it happened this way. 
The records of secular history confirm what the biblical history states. But in Isaiah 44, we read in verse 28, some 120 plus years before the birth of Cyrus, the, 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 speaking of the Lord, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah prophesied that the Babylonian Empire would be destroyed by the Medo Persians. And this long before the event ever occurred, it was prophesied. So, what happened is that God caused a political upheaval. I mean, this was a huge event, people. Here, a mighty empire, the empire of Babylon, was toppled and displaced by the empire of Medo-Persia. But for what purpose did God bring about this political revolution when Cyrus went in? And, 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 and just, we, we've studied that before, how they went in to Babylon. And, and the, the king of Babylon was having some big party, had the booze, had the girls. And you remember the handwriting on the wall and it scared him. And Daniel went in and told him his kingdom was numbered. And that very night he was slain. They were invading the kingdom even as that happened and took it over. The Persians, that was, Meadow Persians, invading the Babylonian kingdom and taking it over. It's a fascinating study. We did that when we were looking at Daniel 9. I don't want to go there right now. But I'm just going to say this, that God established the Medo persian Empire with the end in view of His house where His people assembled for worship. That's what it was all about. God caused an overturn in the empirical, in the empirical succession of this earth with the specific end in view that His people could have a church again in Jerusalem, have the house of God again. You know how many people actually went back to Jerusalem in the beginning to rebuild that temple? We, can, we have the exact number given to us in Ezra chapter 2. And Ezra is to be studied concomitant with Haggai and Zechariah because they're prophesying during this period of time. So it's good to be familiar with the events of the book of Ezra because that will give you a clue as to what's being talked about in those prophets. That's true of all the prophets. If you study historical books, you find out the backdrop against which they prophesied. In Ezra 2, 64 and 65, talking about the people that went back to Jerusalem in answer to the call of Cyrus to go back, to go up and rebuild. We read the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score. That's 42,360 people. Beside their servants and their maids of whom there were 7,337 and there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. So when you put those two verses together and total it up, you had 49,697 Jews. 49,697 Jews going back to Jerusalem to reestablish their church and rebuild the house of God. And God had caused a major political upheaval. And the whole purpose for it was this. Now, in comparison to the population of the earth at that time, 49,697 people was just a small remnant of the earth's population at that time. But God so ordered the political landscape so that tiny little remnant in comparison with the whole of the earth's population could return home and have a church. Amen. Now, I ask you a question. Does that make church important? You got that right. it's, it's important to somebody. You got that right. When you will overturn empires... I believe as much as I am standing here, the reason the American Revolution was a success against all odds was for the same reason. So God-fearing people could have a church. Amen. That's what it was for. God does things like that. God does things like that. Jesus Christ is head over all things to the church. He literally runs this, this universe with a view to what's sitting in this room. Amen. Now, 
When Cyrus allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem, I want you to notice, I told you to cap, remember this. He told them, go up. Go up to Jerusalem. In fact, that Second Chronicles 36, they ended on that word. Let him go up, go up, up, up. There's good reason for that. Because uh, the Jerusalem, well, I'll tell you the reason for that. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Turn over, if you will, to uh, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 16. This is Daniel's prayer for the success of the return of the people and the rebuilding of their city. He knew that the 70 years captivity was fulfilled and it was time, according to the promise of God, for the people to go back and rebuild. And so he prayed this prayer. For the return of the people and the rebuilding of their city. In Daniel 9, 16, he said, O Lord, According to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from Jerusalem. Notice what he calls it, thy holy mountain. But he also called it thy city. It was God's city. It was God's holy mountain. Because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. And so he intercedes for God's city, and he calls that city God's holy mountain. Now, this was the city that God had chosen to place his name there and to be his special dwelling place, the place where his temple, his house, his dwelling place would be constructed. So it figured very importantly in the scheme of things as we read through the Old Testament history. Now, let me just give you a string of verses to establish the importance of Jerusalem in the Old Testament. And you know the curious thing? Interesting thing? For some strange reason, that city's still important. <laughs> I mean, look at international events, how they surround that single place. Even to this day, that city is a very important city in the scheme of international events. It's very important to Jews, obviously, because they still consider it their rightful homeland. It's important to Christians because the events of the New Testament took place there and in its environs. Not that we attach to that piece of real estate any more sanctity than to any other. I don't think we have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. Jesus taught that. He said the day is coming when you won't need to go there. The Father's looking for those who worship in spirit and truth, not necessarily those who worship in Jerusalem. But still, because of its history, it holds significance for Christians. And Muslims also consider it very sacred because they believe at the place where the uh, mosque is located, they believe that Muhammad was ascended into heaven from there. And that's when he got information that he should, uh, Muslims should pray five times a day when he ascended up from that, the dome of the rock there where that uh, mosque is located in Jerusalem. I read about that this morning. I wondered, why is that so special to Muslims? Well, because they believe that Allah, I mean, Muhammad ascended up to heaven and saw Allah. And when he got up there, he saw Moses too. And Allah said, I want him to pray 50 times a day. And then he went over and talked to Moses, and Moses said, Go back and tell Allah to cut that down, because that's too much. That'll be too oppressive for the people to have to pray 50 times a day. So he went back and asked Allah, and Allah said, Okay, we'll make it five times. <laughs> so Moses advises Muhammad to go back to Allah and say, Would you rethink this thing 50 times? Come on, that's too much. Okay, we'll cut it 45 down. We'll make it five times a day. And so that's why you see these Muslims praying toward Mecca. At first, uh, uh, he wanted them praying toward Jerusalem, but then the, they fell out with him. And so on a mad, he decided, Okay, now you pray toward Mecca instead of Jerusalem. He changed his mind. Oh, how reliable Muhammad is as a source of truth. <laughs> Oh, yeah. They, they, in other words, their revelators can contradict each other. Yeah, well, it uh, doesn't work that way in God's book. <laughs> Thank God. Ours have to be consistent. Okay. But anyway, we come to, just to point out the, why that city is so important in the scheme of things. In Jeremiah uh, 17, 67 and 68, Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph, 
and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. See, that's his mountain. And he built his sanctuary. That's the place of his house. Like the high places, like the earth, which he hath established forever. Then come over to Second Chronicles. We're just noting why this place is called God's city and God's holy mountain. Why this was so significant. In Second Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 6. But I have chosen Jerusalem, God speaking, that my name might be there. And I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Then in 2 Chronicles seven fifteen and 16, God says, Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house which was on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. I want you to notice that God put his name there. This house, God put his name in that house. I want you to think about that for a moment. When you put your name to something, you identify with it. You sign your name to something. That's, that's putting your stamp of approval on it. You're putting your John Hancock on it. You're identifying with it. You're owning it as yours. And so when God says of that house, I put my name there, God's owning that house to be especially his house. He approves it. He owns it. And therefore, when you went before that house and you worshiped in that house, you were before the name of God, worshiping the name of God, exalting the name of God. And when you sinned against that house, you were sinning against the name of God. Now, I will show you, but I'm going to just jump ahead and make this point, what the temple was to the Jews in Jerusalem in the Old Testament. This church is to Christians in the New This is God's house in the New Testament. And God has put his name here. That is why it is called the church of God. That is why it is called the church of Christ. So to sin against this is to sin against the name. That's it. To defile this is to defile the name. To besmirch this is to besmirch the name. To neglect this is to neglect the name. You get the point. God's name was in that place. He took this place very, very seriously so that all their desecrations and neglect and indifference and abuse was an attack on the name of God as well as on his house. In Psalm chapter 76, 1 and 2. Further, just demonstrating how significant this place was called the Holy Mountain. And this will explain why the book of Second Chronicles says go up. Up in Psalm 76, 1 and 2, in Judah, that's where the temple was in that province of Judah, is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem, that's short for Jerusalem. In Salem is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. That being the case, and, and, and the next thing I want to point out, though, before I get to this other point I want to make, is in Psalm 87, God having chosen Jerusalem and put his temple there and put his name in that place so that it was his city and his holy mountain that he sanctified and made it holy with his presence, he esteemed that above every other place in the whole of the land of Israel. And I, in Psalm 87, 1 and 2, his foundation is in the holy mountains. The whole government of Israel was founded there. The whole purpose of their being was founded there. And the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. I am sure there are some very scenic and picturesque places in the land of Israel. And I'm sure it was much more so back then than it is now. So much of that nation... And its landscape was destroyed by invading armies. It wasn't the... When it started out, people, that land, it wasn't the dust bowl that it is today. It was fertile. It was like the land of Egypt, like the Garden of God. You say, well, Egypt is a dust bowl. It wasn't originally. But you see, because of their sins, the invading armies went in and cut down their forests and cut down their foliage. It wasn't always like that. It was fertile. It was rich. It was green, luscious. 
And I'm sure there were some wonderful, wonderful, beautiful places in the land of Israel, some lovely seaside resorts where you could go and enjoy it. But in God's estimation, none of them paralleled his dwelling in Zion where his church is. He put that above every other resort that a Jew might enjoy in the promised land. Any other beautiful spot in the promised land. In fact, north of there were the forests of Lebanon. Renowned in the Bible for their rich foliage and their beauty. And yet even they were not to compare with this mountain where God's house was. He loved that more than every other dwelling of Jacob. He loves the place where his house is, where his church is. And he exalted this above every other place on the earth. And that's why it was called God's mountain. Meaning now that any time you went up to the house of God to worship, I don't care what direction you came from, when you went to Jerusalem, you went up. That's why 2 Chronicles ends on that word, up. And why Ezra gave the decree, go up. And, and, and just let me show you that. This is fascinating. Uh, come over as an example. In um, 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. Follow, hope you're following along with this little history lesson we've got going this morning. I shouldn't mention that word history. That might be a turnoff for some of my grandkids that don't find that to be one of their favorite subjects. History. Especially with my grandson Ashton with a major history test hanging over his head. <laughs> In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 27. Um, now back up a little bit and get a little background of what's going on here. After King Solomon died, the nation reached a zenith of glory under King Solomon. I mean, a time of, of, of great wealth and, and, and splendor. It was a time of peace. And Solomon was a tremendous uh, engineer, building engineer. And it was under his reign that they built the first temple. Prior to this, their house of worship had been a little tent that they would construct in different places in their journeys. And now they built a solid permanent structure in Jerusalem under Solomon. And David in uh, 1 Chronicles 23, describing what that building was supposed to be like, used a very interesting expression. He said that, in fact, I'm going to read it to you. You don't have to turn there, okay? I'm just going to read it to you because I love the way it's worded. Uh, it's just an interesting, interesting um, interesting word, a uh, couple of words here. In uh, uh, First Chronicles 23, um, Solomon said, pardon me, it's 22. I had the wrong chapter, 22. He said in verse 5, David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender. And the house that is to be builded for the Lord must be, I love this, exceeding magnificent of fame and glory throughout all countries. This was a building that was incomparable to any other building in all countries. If you and I could have seen Solomon's temple, we would have been awestruck. I mean, the stones, the cedar wood, the fir wood, the overlaying of the inner precincts with gold, the designs of palm trees and cherubim, and it would have, it would have taken our breath away to have seen and then after that, Solomon built his own house, and he had a special uh, uh, passage from his house into the temple. And when the queen of Sheba came and she saw these buildings, she said, why, the half wasn't even told me. It took her breath away. And this was a queen that was used to wealth and grandeur. And when she saw what Solomon built, she was blown away. There remained no more spirit in her. She just, she was overwhelmed by what she saw. Oh, wouldn't I love to have seen that? It was exceeding magnificent. And uh, so anyway, God, God placed a great deal of uh, premium on this place. And so, it, it, but anyway, after Solomon uh, died, his son Rehoboam came to the throne. Now, one thing about Solomon, he brought the nation to a zenith of glory, but uh, he was oppressive. And he taxed the people oppressively and worked them oppressively. So when Rehoboam, his son, came to the throne, a bunch of them said, look, lighten the load and we'll, we'll serve you. And he wouldn't do it. In fact, he said he'd make it worse. And so ten tribes revolted against that oppression. 
and established a kingdom. The ten tribes north of Jerusalem established what came to be known as Israel or Ephraim with a capital city in Samaria. And their first king was a guy named Jeroboam. And then Solomon's son just had two tribes left that were loyal to him, and that was Judah, and that was Benjamin. So anyway, that lays the background for what happens here. Here's Jeroboam, king of the northern kingdom, and he says in verse 27, uh, verse 26 of, of 1 Kings 12, he says, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people, watch it now, go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Now bear in mind, Jerusalem's down here. These ten tribes are north. Now, looking at it, they're going to be going south. Now, normally when we go south, we say we go down. We don't say we go up. We say we go down. We went down to Alabama to visit my parents, see, when they lived down there. Because we came from the north. But here they were coming from the north, going south. And yet Jeroboam says when they're going south, they're going up. You know why? Because that's God had exalted his house in a mountain. So it didn't matter where you came from. When you went to Jerusalem, you went up, up. And he says, if they go up there to sacrifice, which was the place all Jews were supposed to go to sacrifice, he said, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even to Rehoboam. I love where we're coming to. King of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. They'll return their loyalties to the, the rightful king. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. You know, why do you have to drive that far to go to church? Come on, give me a break. What do you mean? You drive two hours to go to church? There's churches all over Strathroy. What's the matter with you that you go that far? That was exactly his reasoning. It's too much. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And so he set one God in the southern part of his kingdom and one in the northern part. Nobody had to go that far to go to church. As long as you're sincere, you see, it really doesn't matter. You know that kind of reasoning. It's, it's nothing new under the sun. It's too much for you to have to go that far to go to church. Well, yeah, they can go somewhere closer and compromise the word of God in doing it. <laughs> and so can you. So could we all. But I'm just going for the point that when you went to that house, no matter what direction you came from, you went up, up. Uh, you can see this in the life of our Lord. If you go over to John chapter 2, all the way over in the New Testament, here's Jesus. He's in Galilee. That's, that's in the north. It's in the north. He was at the city. Of, in fact, he was in Capernaum, which was in the north. And he decided to go to Jerusalem, which would have been south where our Lord was. And it says here in John 2, 13, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went, get it now, up to Jerusalem. Didn't say he went down, said he went up. So any time you went to Jerusalem, no matter what direction you came from, you went up. Now, enough history, let me make an application. Come over to the book of Isaiah chapter 2, and let's move over to the times we're living in, into the New Testament times. This is a very, very important point. I know I'm stuck on this going up to Jerusalem thing, but I have a reason. I'm not just going to give you a history lesson this morning. I'm going to give you some practical teaching. Amen. I'm going to show you how this is profitable to you today for doctrine, for instruction yeah. and righteousness, yeah. for correction, for reproof and comfort and hope. Here in the book of Isaiah, he prophesies of the New Testament times. And he says in Isaiah chapter 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Do you realize we're living in the last days? Yes. We are. We are. The last days. Hebrews chapter 1. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake unto the fathers in times past by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. This is the last age of time ushered in by Jesus Christ. We're in the last days. The ends of the world are come upon us. John said in 1 John, it is the last time. All right, now that being established, let's go to verse 2. And it came to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. It won't just be for the nation of the Jews. All nations, Gentiles, will have access to it. 
And my people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up, up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And what happens when you get there? What happens when you get to God's house? And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. We're going to go, and we're going to let God teach us what he wants us to do, and then we're going to go out there, and we're going to do it. Amen. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It's interesting, brethren, that in going up to a New Testament church, you're going up to an out, a mountain. And that the people going there are going up. Now, the first thing I want to po- point out, the first New Testament church you read of in the Bible, where do you think it was established? Hmm? In Jerusalem. The Catholics are wrong when they say that Rome is the mother church. Oh, no. The mother church was Jerusalem. All true New Testament churches come out of that first church that was established in that city of Jerusalem. This actually fulfilled a prophecy. Fulfills several. Fulfills this one, for one. But there's another prophecy it fulfills that's found over here in Psalm 110. Talk about after Jesus ascended into heaven. Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Ask you Christians a question. Has that happened? Has that, has that scripture been fulfilled? Hmm? Has it? Yeah. Where is Jesus Christ right now, people? Seated at the right hand of God in the majesty on high. Fulfilling this prophecy, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now notice what's happening as he's sitting at that right hand. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. The Lord is going to send the rod of the strength of Jesus Christ out of Zion. Now, turn over to the book of Acts. I'm going to show you that happening. I'm going to show you the rod of Jesus' strength going out of Zion. And remember, when we talk about Zion, we're talking about Jerusalem. We're talking about where the house of God was built. We've already read the verses that say that, that he chose that Mount Zion, which he loved. And there he caused his sanctuary to be established. In Jerusalem, in Mount Zion, the Mount of the Lord's house, the holy mountain. But this is exactly where the church was established, the first New Testament church. And look at what the Lord said to his apostles. Watch the rod of his strength. Watch it now, people. Go out of Zion. Be sent forth. He says to his apostles, he said, um, just keep your finger there. Let me read one other verse to fill it out. I just, it just popped into my mind this would be a good one. All right. Luke 24, 49. Let me throw this one into the mix. Luke 24, 49. The Lord says, Jesus Christ, behold, he's talking to his apostles. I send the promise, watch it now, of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He says, I want you guys to camp out in Jerusalem. I want you to stay there and I'm going to empower you. And notice what they're going to do with that power, with that power. He says in Acts 1.8, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. I submit to you this morning that right there is the rod of the strength of Jesus Christ sent out of Zion. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. And then watch it go out of Jerusalem. Watch the rod of strength go out of Zion. Watch that power move forth through the earth. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. That's where it'll start. There's where the first church is. And in all Judea, they went around to the neighboring villages and cities and preached it. And in Samaria, the northern kingdom of Israel, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, all the way through the western world. By the time the Apostle Paul came to the end of his life, the Roman world all around through the Mediterranean was thickly planted with Christian churches. They were all over the place. 
You see the rod of God's strength, the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ, going forth, conquering the hearts of men, both Jews and Gentiles. But where did it all start? In Jerusalem. Out of Jerusalem shall go forth the law, just like the prophet said. Isn't that amazing? just like Isaiah said it was going to be. Back in Isaiah 2 that we read, he said out, he said for the law, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And that literally happened when the gospel went out of Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the earth. That rod of strength went out and it worked its way up through Europe moving westward over to the British Isles, over the ocean, here, here, all the way to the western coast. (laughs) Amazing. Uttermost parts of the earth, literally to the other side of the world. Now, here's something I want to read to you that I came across this week that I thought was very good. A fellow named Benjamin Weiss wrote this, and I want to pass it on to you. He said, we need not say much about how the omniscience of God is displayed in the wonderful fact that in the very land of the covenant, in the very midst of that people, watch it now, in the very midst of that people who rejected and crucified the Savior, the first church of Christ on earth was established. In the very city that clamored for the death of the Son of God, that decreed His demise in that very place, God established the first church. What would cavillers and blasphemers had said had it been otherwise? Had the Christian community been formed in any of the heathen countries... Would it not have been considered as a fiction of the idolatrous priests? Think about it. If it had been established in a heathen country, in a heathen city, if that's where it got started, then the Jews would have said, why, that's just some fictitious myth of the pagan priests among which there are many. But no, it got started in the capital city of monotheism, Jerusalem. In the city that was God's city, in God's holy mountain, among God's nation. That were unique in holding to the position that there is only one God. The Lord our Lord is one Lord. Would it not have been considered as a fiction of the idolatrous priests? Israel scattered among the nations. And the church of Christ having begun in Zion at Jerusalem, which is exactly where Isaiah said it would happen. (laughs) Out from there the rod of strength would go forth. The fact that the church of Christ having begun in Zion at Jerusalem are the most wonderful and enduring monuments and intestable, incontestable witnesses of the truth of Christianity. Brethren, this stuff we have in here is real. Amen. How did it get here? Where did it start? It started exactly where God said it would start. In Jerusalem, in his city, in his holy mountain, and it would go out from there. Wow. Furthermore, this church that God has established, you realize our church is a reformed version of the Old Testament church. Under the Old Testament church, the house of God was the temple in Jerusalem, the stone structure that Solomon had built and then later was rebuilt under the influence of the prophet Haggai, as we will see. But that building was destined to be destroyed again and was in 70 A.D. Yet God's church, God's house that he established in Jerusalem lives on. You know why? Because it has been reformed and it is no longer a structure of stone and wood and gold. It is a structure made up of believers in Jesus Christ who are builded together and habitation of God through the Spirit. And we who are members of this church are referred to as living stones. I am looking at the house of God and you are the stones builded together that make it up and God inhabits it and puts his name here. Amen. 
I want you to show you something about this church. I'm talking about any true, I'm not talking about these fake churches out here. I'm talking about any true New Testament Bible-believing Baptist church. I want to show you where that's located, how God views that church. I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul writing to a local church at Thessalonica. He could say the same thing if he were writing to the church at Detroit. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, and I'm working up to a practical point here. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is... Now look at where God considers our church to be. In God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's mind-blowing, people. But that's what God considers this church to be. He considers it to be in Himself and in His Son. Now let me show you, let me show you where his son is, where this church is positionally in his son. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, and just look there, and I'm going to thumb back to Isaiah 2, and I'm going to plug it in, and hopefully you're going to see it. Ephesians chapter 1, 20 and 21, speaking of Jesus after he raised him from the dead, which he wrought, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. God positioning the church in Jesus Christ has exalted it above the highest mountain in this earth and the highest pinnacle of power in this earth and in heaven. Even though we are on earth, God views us connected to Jesus Christ who is our head in heaven. This church is on earth, but its government is in heaven. This church is on earth, but its head is in heaven. God views us positionally with Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. No wonder he says that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills. I mean, the peak of the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, is nothing but a tiny little ant hill compared to this church Amen. and the way God sees it. Brethren, you are in a very exalted institution So understanding that God has exalted this institution above the hills, that this, its headquarters are in heaven, what the Bible calls the heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion above where God is. I draw this practical point. Anytime you go to church, I don't care where you come from, you are going up. And therefore, this should be the high point in your week. Yes. Got it? Yes. This should be the high point. Because when you come here, you're coming up from wherever you are. I don't care if you have to come down a mountain to get here. By the time you get here, you're in a place that's above the highest mountain you could ever descend from in order to get here. See where I was going with that? You see the importance of when God speaks of going to his church, he says you're going up. We're going up. And this is what we say. We say, come ye, let us go up. Let's go up to church today. Not just to church, let's go up there. Up to the Lord's house. Of the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and I'm his instrument to do that. Amen. And then we will walk in his paths. You take it out there and you practice it. That's what you're told to do. Now, God sanctified that temple situated in Jerusalem. That's why it's called a holy mountain. He set it apart, sanctified it with his presence. And when they built that temple under King Solomon, they were fulfilling God's intent in having saved them out of the bondage of Egypt, as we read in the book of Exodus. His whole purpose for taking him out of the servitude of Egypt and through the Red Sea and through the wilderness and bringing him into the land of Canaan was so they could build him a dwelling place. That's the whole objective. Follow this now. This is for our instruction. Exodus chapter 15. 
Exodus chapter 15. What I'm trying to do, in case you haven't picked up on it yet, is show you how important God's worship in God's house is. That's it. This is not a take it or leave it proposition, people. This is not something that should just be stuck over here in a small corner of our life. Come on. It should be central. Amen. It's the most important thing. In Exodus 15 and verse 17, after they came through the Red Sea and they were worshiping God for the victory, it says in verse 17, talking about what God was going to do with those people, how he would bring them into the promised land. He said, Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. He brought them into that land to plant them in church for them to be in his house. And this, is, this sanctuary is referring to God's house in Jerusalem where God was worshipped. It was his church under the Old Testament. Turn to Psalm 122. Psalm 122, this is where the people went. Three times a year all the males were to appear in that house, not empty-handed. And if their families were able to go, they went with them also. I've sometimes wondered about that. On those major feast days, three times a year, the whole populace of the nation showing up in Jerusalem. Can you imagine the operation that had to be set up to accommodate that? All those thousands and thousands of people coming into town. I mean, it'd be a great place to own a bed and breakfast. I mean, three times a year, you got business. I'm serious. You had to have had a way to accommodate all these people. I mean, literally, Jerusalem's whole economy revolved around the fact this was the holy place where everybody came. I mean, you had to have vendors of food. You had to have uh, places of lodging. And the thing that blows my mind, how did they handle the sewage? (laughs) All these people coming in there. (laughs) They didn't have modern plumbing like we had. They must have had some way to dispose of all that mess. I I do. Most people don't think of stuff like that. But I think of stuff like that. I, 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 I think of stuff like that. What did they do? All these people eating and pooping and everything. All these days they're hanging out there in the city. What did... I'm, but you know what? With an engineer like Solomon, I'm confident he had it covered. I don't know exactly how. But I'm confident he had it covered. Because God considered that city the perfection of beauty. So somehow, some way... That was taken care of. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask. Maybe when I have my day with Solomon. Solomon, how'd you pull it off? All those people coming in there three times a year from all parts, crowding in there, hanging out for several days, offering sacrifices. Can you imagine the thousands and thousands of sacrifices that were offered in that temple? Literally, rivers of blood flowed in that place. How did they handle that? How did they do that? Well, you see, they had a whole tribe dedicated to the management. You ever stop and think about that? Thousands of Levites. You needed thousands of Levites to manage an operation like that to help out the priests. God had it covered. They had their courses, and it was all wonderfully arranged when you read about it. So anyway, um, back to the... (laughs) So here's Psalm 122. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Watch it now. Whither the tribes, that was all the twelve tribes, go up. No matter from what direction they came, north, south, east, or west, they went up. The tribes of the Lord under the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. They went there to worship God. And that's the whole purpose God saved them, was so they could do that, so they could come to his sanctuary. And that hasn't changed. God chooses and saves his people with the end in view of their serving him in his house. I'll give you two, I'll give you a verse that clearly states it. If you look at Psalm 65, and you might remember a few years ago, I did a whole series on this psalm. I started it on the Sunday that... All Vane and Elka were here for our big church weekend. I had the most fun with this. Psalm 65, 4. 
I'm going to show you why God chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, why he died and suffered on that cross, why his Holy Spirit took up an abode in you and changed your heart and gave you eternal life. I'm going to show you what it was for. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach unto thee. For what purpose? That he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. God saved you so you could come to church and worship and find satisfaction there. Something to satisfy your soul. To experience there the goodness of God unfolded to you in his wonderful gospel. And this church, the local church, is God's house in the New Testament. As he writes in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. When he said, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Every single local church constituted according to the law of the New Testament is God's house. And God chose you and brought you to himself for you to be there, to dwell there. People that think they can have Christianity without having the church are sadly deceived. You got that right. Amen. Sadly deceived. You cannot read the New Testament. I mean, for crying out loud, the books of the New Testament were written to churches or pastors. You can't say, uh, we read in Revelation of the seven churches of Asia and Jesus Christ is standing in the midst. If you want to be where Jesus Christ is hanging out, be in a New Testament church. Because that's where he's hanging out. Well, I'm a good Christian. I don't need to be in a church. No, you are not a good Christian. If you have that kind of an attitude, you're not even a Christian at all. I didn't say you weren't a child of God. I said you aren't a Christian. A Christian's a follower of Jesus Christ. Every Christian is a child of God, but not every child of God is a Christian. I mean, I'm going to give you the verse, people. There's no over, under, around it. It's in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. This is a church, a local church in Antioch. It's a church where the Apostle Paul was sent out on his evangelistic mission to the Gentiles. In Acts 11, 26, and when he'd found him, that's when Barnabas found Saul, he brought him unto Antioch. Watch it, hold your seats. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. For a whole year they went to church. Assembled, just like we've done today, assembling ourselves with the church. And taught much people. And connective thought. The disciples. What disciples are we talking about? The ones right there in that church. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, where there was that church where Saul and Barnabas assembled for a year. The Christians were the disciples, were the church. And there is no biblical Christianity outside of the church. That's where it's at, people. That's where, that's where the action was in the Old Testament. Why do you think that God so severely judged the Jewish people and destroyed took away their church in 70 AD because they didn't prize it, right. didn't value it, didn't take care of it. They got, they got loose, got careless. God took it away from them. And the sad lament was made, sad lament was made. After that temple was burned and destroyed, I, I, I am always touched by the sad lamentation expressed in Isaiah 64, 11, our holy and our beautiful house. Where our fathers praise thee is burned up with fire. And all our pleasant things are laid waste. We've lost our church. Yes, the end to which God has saved his people is that they serve him in his house. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing when we get to heaven. You realize that? Jesus Christ said in John 14, 2 and 3. John 14, 2 and 3. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you in the Father's house. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. If you don't like being in the house of God on earth, you might find you'll be miserable in heaven. Because that's where we're going to be. 
serving God in his house above. And if you're going to serve him there in heaven, why not serve him in his house here below? Well, (laughs) I haven't gotten to all the background information. I'm going to save that for next week, God willing. But the point is this, Haggai comes along. And what he's doing, the Jews have lost a church. They lost it under the Babylonians. Seventy years, they had no house of God. And so now Cyrus has issued the decree for them to go back and rebuild. And they do. They go back. But then something causes the work to be suspended. And they look at that as a great excuse to just not continue the building program. They get it started and they don't finish it. And so Haggai comes along and his prophecy is telling them, look, you got time to build your own houses. You need to build my house, the house of God. And he comes along to, in, to rebuke and to exhort the people, admonish the people to be about the business of finishing the work that had been started. That's what that's all about. Haggai is a book about finishing what had been started in building the house of God, setting it up so that God might be glorified according to his intent and saving his people. And that is that they worship him at his house. Well, that's all I've got for today. I hope you got something out of all that scratching and rambling around. I didn't get as far as I wanted, but that's okay. We'll pick that up next time.